next speaker is Shula Lazar. Shula was born and bred in Melbourne and came to Perth three and a half years ago to take up the position of principal of Carmel College. It is the top independent school and the only Jewish school in WA. Shula was born into an observant family. Uh, her grandparents fled Poland before the war and settled in Carlton. And uh, like many other Jewish refugees, her mother converted to Judaism to marry her father, who was brought up in a traditional Jewish home. Shula is the mother of four children and the wife to one husband. She claims to know nothing about art and can barely draw a stick figure, uh, but is a clear supporter of the arts, and I'm sure her perspective today will be. Uh, fascinating. Welcome to Shul. Thank you very much. I also did put in my bio that we have a fantastic art department led by Leanne Maysmark, who not only gets the best marks for her students, but she inspires students to, to be artists, and I think that is really the measure of an art teacher. So, with your permission, Leanne, I am speaking here at this art gathering today. When reading the Bible, it is illuminating to find the meaning of a word from context, and more so the first context, the first instance in the Bible where this word is used. This is the method that I have used today to interpret meaning and message from the words of the verse from Micha. The verse from Micha starts with a question. Ma told what is good? How can we define and recognise that which is good? Does good fall into the realm of subjectivity? Is what is good for me also good for you? The word tov, good, is used repeatedly in the story of creation. At each stage of creation, God takes stock of what he has done and concludes that it is good. So our first understanding of what is good, coming from the story of creation, is that the world, in its pure equilibrium state, is good. There are many instances where human beings deviate from this goodness and create hate, evil, suffering. But the world, as it was created, was and is good. And part of our job is to be partners with God to bring the world back to Tom, back to goodness. In the words of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, he says, the flames of injustice, violence and oppression are not inevitable. The victory of the strong over the weak, the many over the few, the, min the, the manipulative over those with integrity, even though they have happened in most times and in most places, they are not written into the structure of the universe. The structure of the universe is good. The story of creation also tells us what is not good. Lotov heyot adam levado. It is not good for man to be alone. The phrase of not good is also used by Yitro, Jethro, Moses' father in law, to describe the way in which he judged the people. The task was too big for one man. Moses had to sit from morning until night without help. It was not good for Moses to judge alone. Human beings are meant to be with other human beings. There is a reason why solitary confinement is a punishment. It is good for man to be with others. It is not good for man to be alone. But in our being with others, we create a challenge only alone can libertarianism reign supreme. Only alone can we have unfettered rights. The presence of the other brings a curtailing of individual rights. The tension between the rights of the individual and the goodness found in being with others is answered by what God calls on us to do in this verse from Micha. To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. Justice, in Hebrew mishpat, 
means, ret means re retributive justice. It refers to the rule of law through which disputes are settled by right rather than might. Law distinguishes between innocent and guilty. It establishes a set of rules binding on all by means of which the members of society act in a way as to pursue their own interests without infringing on the rights and freedoms of others. The word mishpat, justice, is first used in the story of Abraham arguing with God to save the city of Sodom. In this story, God plans to destroy the city of Sodom, and Abraham argues that, that it should be saved in the merit of a few righteous people. Abraham's definition of justice is twofold. The first is that collective punishment is not just. If the city has some righteous people in it, surely they do not deserve to be punished alongside the wicked. Utilitarianism is trumped by libertarianism. We must value and honour the individual. The second point of justice we learn from this story is that Abraham believes not only that good will prevail, but that the righteous have the ability to enable the wicked to change. If there are a few righteous people in the city, they hold the ability to change the city, change the people in the city. We should not punish prematurely. We need to give people time to repent and the tools to change, to live a better tomorrow. Therefore, to do justice is to value and respect the individual and to believe that we can repent and be forgiven. We all have the capacity to become better and to become righteous. Micha then says that we need to love kindness, chesed. What is kindness? It is usually, it, 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 chesed is usually translated as kindness, but it also means love. Not love as emotion or passion, but love expressed as deed. The first story in the Bible that talks about kindness is that of Rebekah and Eliezer. Eliezer is the faithful servant of Abraham who has been tasked to find a wife for Abraham's son, Isaac. Although Abraham's only instruction had been that the woman needed to come from his family back home, Eliezer was looking for something more. He planned a test. After his long travels, he stated that if he finds a woman, who not, only offers to, uh, who not only offers him water, but offers to water his camels, then through this show of kindness, this woman would be worthy of marrying Isaac. And indeed, Rebecca passed the test, watering Eliezer and his many camels. She showed love expressed as deed. How did this deed of watering the camels show kindness? Kindness is measured by what we give without expecting anything in return. Nature, or rather physics, tells us that for every action there will be an equal and opposite reaction. But kindness is above nature. It is done not for the reaction, but purely for the imperative to give to the other. When God created the world and saw it was good, his creation was a one-way action. He created not to get anything in return, he did it because it was good. And so it is with kindness. So to be good, we need both justice and kindness. The beauty of justice is that it belongs to a world of order constructed out of universal rules through which each of us stands equally before the law. They said, kindness, by contrast, is intrinsically personal. We cannot care for the sick bring comfort to the distressed, or welcome a visitor impersonally. If we do so, it merely shows that we have not understood what these activities are. Justice demands disengagement. Kindness is an act of engagement. Justice is best administered without emotion. Kindness exists only in virtue of emotion, empathy and sympathy, feeling with and feeling for. We act with kindness because we know what it feels like to be in need of kindness. We comfort mourners because we know what it is like to mourn. Justice requires detachment and IQ. Kindness requires engagement and EQ. 
And lastly, to be good, we must walk humbly with God. We must make space for God to be beside us. We must shrink our ego and let God into that space. God lives in the room we make for him in the human heart. In the beginning, God created the world as a home for humanity. Since then, he has challenged humanity to create a world that will be a home for him. God lives wherever we treat one another as beings in his image. Only with humility can you make space for God, and only with humility can you let in the other and resolve to honour the individual while not being alone. Thank you. Thank you, Shula. That was incredibly illuminating um, and empowering, very much so.